Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Hi, my name is Renee Hobbs and welcome to today's webinar, The Road to Copyright Clarity. Um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Melissa from the Northeast Regional Library System and we're excited to present this webinar to you. Uh, just a couple of ground rules before I turn it over to um, Melissa. Uh, if you're not uh, speaking, you can mute your microphone. And um, let me take just a minute and show you where you can find uh, the resources for this program. Um, if you navigate yourself to the Media Education Lab, that's mediaeducationlab.com, and you scroll down to events, and you look, uh, it, actually it's cool, the Road to Copyright Clarity is considered both an upcoming event and a past event. That's because it's happening today. So if you click there, you'll be able to access the uh, learning objectives for the program, the slides for the program, a little bit about some of the resources that we're gonna be looking at today, um, and some big ideas right there. Um, but before we get started, so that's go to mediaeducationlab.com, click on events, and look at upcoming events, the road to copyright clarity. Melissa, will you introduce yourself to the, uh, looks like we have quite a lot of folks uh, joining us today. Will you, um, will you welcome our team? Absolutely. Good afternoon. This is Melissa with the Northeast Ohio Regional Library System, and I want to welcome you all here to the Road to Copyright Clarity. We are thrilled to be having a collaboration between the Northeast Ohio Regional Library System and the Media Education Lab at the University of Rhode Island's Harrington School of Communication and Media. We are also thrilled that we have Renee Hobbs as our presenter. Renee is the author of Copyright Clarity, How Fair Use Supports Digital Learning, and nine other books about digital and media literacy education. She's a professor and the director of the Media Education Lab, where she co-directs the graduate certificate in digital literacy. Uh, Renee is an educator, researcher, and activist who advances the quality of media literacy education in the United States and around the world. She is the founding editor of the Journal of Media Literacy Education, and today she is going to take us on the road to copyright clarity. Renee? Thank you so much. That was a, a, a lovely introduction. Um, so I'm, it's only a fast one hour program, and so we're going to do some. Um, we're going to do some quick uh, resources and a kind of big picture perspective, and then at a subsequent webinar, we'll be able to dig in more uh, in more detail to that. Um, and I'm just checking to see if you can see my slides. Let me share my slides with you. You can now, I think. Um, you can now see some of the, um, the books that I've written about media literacy and, of course, my new book called The Library Screen Scene, which is about film and media literacy in schools, colleges, and communities. For this project, I was able to um, learn from about 178 school, public, and academic librarians about their uses of film and media literacy in school, public, and academic libraries. Uh, if you haven't already uh, placed this information in the chat room, I'd be grateful if you could tell us what city and state you're in right now, how copyright materials are used in your workplace, and what one, qu one question or one topic that you hope to learn today. So to give you an understanding about why this topic is so important to me, I have to be transparent about my motives. I am really interested in how literacy is expanding in a digital age, because that's affecting the skills and abilities that we have for making sense of a variety of different kinds of digital texts. It affects the literacy practices of reading and writing themselves, and of course, it affects how we engage in teaching with media and technology. 
and how we teach about media and technology. So these are the seven questions that I want to use to guide our learning today. How do people use copyrighted works for learning? What myths and misinformation might interfere with understanding copyright law? What's the purpose of copyright? How does copyright both protect owners and users? What's the doctrine of fair use? What questions help people engage in the fair use reasoning process? And why is an understanding of copyright essential for everyone today? So let me just say one thing before I go any further. It's possible that you signed up for this webinar because you have a burning question. <laughs> I'm, I know that sometimes you have a burning question, something that's super on your mind. So if you have a burning question that absolutely needs to be answered because it's affecting your work, your practice, that's the kind of question that you put uh, privately into the chat room especially if you add me your email and I will respond to private questions offline after this uh, program has completed. Because really today you're going to get a bigger, better understanding about copyright and fair use as it relates to libraries and learning and education. And perhaps some of the questions that you have will be answered through this um, program, but it's possible that there's a very particular question that you want an answer to, and I'm happy to answer those. As I said, send me a private chat, include your email, and you'll get an answer from me promptly. Okay, so let's just go back to, back to the slides here. So I have to give you a sense of kind of where I'm coming from. Beginning in 2000 and seven, 2006, excuse me, I became involved with uh, the work of Patricia Aufterheide and Peter Yazzie at American University's School of Communication. Um, at that time, they were working with documentary filmmakers way back in 2005 to help filmmakers understand what, what kinds of copyrighted material filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, could use, could not use under the uh, provisions of copyright and fair use. And this topic absolutely entranced me because of how, how, how much media literacy educators rely on using copyrighted materials for teaching and learning. So I was involved in helping develop the code of best practices in fair use for media literacy education way back in 2006. And since then, I've been following the um, work of um, Peter Yazi and Patricia Alfterheide very, very carefully. Some of you may know that Peter Yazi is the, um, one of the, leading, the world's leading experts on American copyright law. He literally wrote the book called Copyright which is used in every American law school in this country. He's a really amazing uh, teacher and leader and scholar. Um, and this approach to teaching creative communities, like librarians, like educators, like journalists, like academics, like artists, like software uh, people, how to clarify the scope of their rights and responsibilities under copyright. I find it a really important and refreshing perspective. And the library community agrees with me. Notice in 2014, they created the Code of Best Practice and Fair Use for academic and research libraries. So the work I'm sharing today comes from within this noble and robust tradition, the Codes of Best Practice. There's a copy of the Code of Best Practice that I helped to create back in 2006. Um, we were thrilled when the National Council of Teachers of English adopted it as its official policy on copyright and fair use. And some of the ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you come from that document, which is freely available online. So 
part of the reason why everyone cares about copyright is because we're so aware of how copyright is vital to the creative process. We understand that in some ways, as the filmmaker Nina Paley uh, uh, shared in her little two minute YouTube video, all creative work is derivative. Let's just take a minute and take a look at what does she mean by that? I will mm, hold on here. Let me see if I can share my screen with you. Oh, oh, oh hold on here. Play from the current slide. Mm -hmm. There we go. Take a look at this little video. In just under two minutes, um, in just under two minutes, um, Nina Paley takes you through the history of art and she shows that all artists build on the work of artists who came before them. So when we talk about creativity and copyright, it's partly because we really respect that idea. Aristotle said, um, you know, 2000 years ago, um, there are no new ideas under the sun. Human creativity is combinatorial. He said, when it comes to human creativity, one plus one equals three. Right? So that's crazy, right? But it refers to that idea that we collide old ideas together and in the process we create new ideas. Now, we all respect and appreciate the creative process, but a lot of us have myths and misinformation about copyright that can interfere with our, our learning. And since I've had the opportunity over the last 15 years now to teach thousands and thousands of teachers and librarians and college students and high school students and middle school students about copyright and fair use, I find it important to hose out the miss and, miss and misinformation that are plentiful on this topic. Uh, and of course, I'm just going to share uh, three strategies that I've found that people in my community have about this topic. There's a whole bunch of people who simply don't want to learn about copyright. I call them the see no evil folks. They would never come to a workshop like this, right? They would never uh, dare to because they just don't want to know. Then there are folks that we think about as close the door people, right? These people might be um, torrenting uh, illegal downloads at home. These people might be violating copyright, but they're doing it behind closed doors. Nobody knows about it. So they're in the closet, so to speak. They're, they're, secret, they're secretly doing what they want, potentially uh, violating copyright, but they, they, they keep it secret. And then there are folks who have some idea about copyright. They learned something somewhere and they are hyper compliant, right? They cling to the rules they think they know and sometimes they apply those rules more rigidly with their students or their patrons than they do with themselves. So here are six statements, all of which are kind of inaccurate, but I'm sure you've heard these statements a lot. If it's on the internet, I can copy and use it. As long as I cite my source, I can use it. If I'm not making money off it, I can use it. Copyright is all about protecting owners. Copyright is too complicated for me. It's best left to lawyers and administrators. And fair use, why? That only applies to critiques and parodies. In the next 30 or 40 minutes, I'm gonna show you how wrong all of these ideas are. But it's possible that you have some myths and misinformation about copyright. 
one of the things we have been able to document really clearly is that there is a cost to all the copyright confusion. For sure, copyright confusion means less effective instructional strategies and materials. Copyright confusion also creates distribution hurdles in sharing creative work. And it perpetuates misinformation to the next genera generation, but the most important consequence of copyright confusion is simply less creativity. So there are two problems that have contributed to the copyright confusion. The first is the negotiated agreements between media companies. You might know them by these names, the Agreement on Guidelines for Classroom Copying and Not-for-Profit Educational Institutions, Fair Use Guidelines for Educational Multimedia, and the Guidelines for the Educational Use of Music. Maybe you've seen the charts or graphs that say you can only use 10% or uh, you, can, you, have, you can only use a poem that's less than 250 words, or maybe you thought that was copyright law, but it's not. These guidelines represent negotiated agreements between publishers and publishers. <laughs> and in 2001, Kenneth Cruz wrote a really influential law review article where he said, these documents give them the appearance of law. They look like legal documents, but these qualities are merely illusory. And consequently, the guidelines have had a seriously detrimental effect. They interfere with an actual understanding of the law and erode confidence in the law as created by Congress and the courts. So the first thing we have to do is recognize that those charts that tell you what you can and cannot do are not the law. They can't be used by judges. They aren't, they have been interfering with our real, our deeper understanding of the law. So we have to kind of push aside those charts and tables and see if we can get a deeper understanding of the law. But there's another misunderstanding that seems to have wrecked havoc on people's understanding of the law, and that's people's confusion between plagiarism and copyright, right? We recognize that plagiarism is when you use other people's creative work and you pass it off as your own, right? Plagiarism is an ethical violation of the relationship between um, writers, their readers, and their sources. But that's not the same as copyright infringement. While plagiarism is an ethical violation, nobody ever faced legal action by courts as a result of plagiarism. The solution to plagiarism is citing your sources. But Copyright infringement has legal implications because copyright infringement is a legal violation of the rights of authors, right? And the penalties for copyright infringement can be severe. So we really wanna help make sure that people are not using these terms interchangeably and we recognize how very distinct they are. One of the things I'm really aware of is that librarians and educators want to teach students how to cite their sources, right? And the technical word for that is teaching attribution. Attribution means citing your sources. But it's really important to recognize that citing your sources depends on the norms of the genre. Academic writing has one or two or three sets of norms. To, to use different citation formats, but video PSAs, public service announcements, poetry, informal writing, documentary film, journalism, and websites, they use other methods of citing sources. For example, with websites, sometimes a hyperlink is recognized as a type of attribution, a way of citing your sources. So we think the best way to teach people about how to use sources well is to help students summarize, paraphrase, and direct quote. And I like to use this example because it's kind of fun. Find an article that's interesting to you, read it, and then compose a summary, a paraphrase, and a direct quotation. Kids should start doing this in fourth grade. 
so that they don't end up cutting and pasting their way through college, you know? So now I wanna introduce the central idea. We, we understand that it's not those charts and graphs and copyright and plagiarism are two completely different things. What after all is the purpose of copyright? I'm gonna give you a minute to put your answer into the chat. Take a minute and put your answer to this question into the chat. Open up the uh, orange box and put your answer here. What is the purpose of copyright? Take a minute. See if you can give me a brief answer. Look at them coming. Thank you, Patty. Paul Weber says to encourage creativity through making creative expression monetizable for the creators. Norm says to ensure authors are paid. Deborah says it's to protect creation, to protect your creative work, to protect your rights legally. So lots of you are appreciating the role of copyright in supporting and enabling the creative process. And that is for sure an important thing to realize. When we explain that the purpose of copyright is to promote creativity, innovation, and the spread of knowledge, um, well, sometimes people are freaked out. They say it doesn't say anything about money. <laughs> Notice that the purpose of creativity doesn't say anything about money or about protection. So those words aren't really at the heart of what copyright law is, is purpose is. In Article One, Section Eight of the US Constitution, written in 1787, 1787, Congress said that the purpose of copyright is to promote creativity, innovation, and the spread of knowledge. They used kind of formal language at the time, they said, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So all copyright cases essentially weigh the benefits to society against the benefits to the copyright holder or the creative author. Thinking about copyright in this way, recognizing its purpose is to promote creativity, innovation, and the spread of knowledge, changes the way you think about evaluating copyright claims. <laughs> So Wikipedia's short little one minute movie um, introduces the concept of the public domain. And that concept is really important to understanding the purpose of copyright as well. Oops, I've got to just go like that. Here's a big, big idea important for us to understand how copyright law really works. Uh, everything is copyrighted. If it's a work of expression in fixed or tangible form, ideas cannot be copyrighted, but expressions of ideas can be. So copyright law gives authors a bundle of rights. 
the right to reproduce the work, the right to prepare derivative works based on that work, the right to distribute copies of the work to the public, the right to perform the copyrighted work publicly, and the right to display the copyrighted work publicly. So it really looks like all of these words, except for derivative works, are really about copyrighted work reaching audiences through display, performance, distribution, or reproduction. And that is a very powerful set of controls. In fact, copyright law does enable people to control the creative works they produce. And it's as, a, as an author myself, it's one of the things I love best about copyright. But violating copyright can be expensive, right? So let's just say you illegally downloaded um, the first season of Family Guy, that crazy animated comedy show. Well, that kind of illegal download could be very, very expensive. And when you look at the law that says, um, if you did it willfully, you knew you were illegally downloading, a court may in its discretion increase the award of statutory damages to a sum of not more than $150,000 times, let's just say 22 episodes, we're talking millions and millions of dollars. Violating copyright can be expensive because copyright offers strong protection to owners. In fact, US copyright law is the strongest in the world, which is why intellectual property is our second largest export product after military hardware, sadly, but that's, and that's the case. Copyright offers strong protection to owners. And owners control that, uh, those legal rights through the licensing process. So that's what licenses are. They're just a mechanism that allows the uh, owner to um, control the distribution performance or display of their work. And so here are some examples of different kinds of licensing um, processes that are in play. Um, in education, we have a lot of licensing licensed products um, for movies, when movies are screened for entertainment purposes in schools. But signing a license agreement is a contract. And in the American legal system, the contract overrides fair use. So we recognize that there are certain cases when you need to license um, content in order to use it legally. There are other cases when you don't. So we're gonna be aware that licenses override fair use. And so that's why we wanna be especially aware, make sure that we don't, um, we, get, we don't get into a license arrangement unless we really need to. Creative Commons is a licensing system too, and it's really cool. It's based on the idea that authors can choose to freely give away their intellectual property without payment or permission, but with some other limitations, limitations about how the work could be modified or transformed or how it could be monetized. And it's really cool to think about uh, having more flexible licensing models available for uh, digital authors. But I return to this big idea that everything is copyrighted because it's not really true. There are a lots and lots of exceptions to copyright. And today I want to talk about the, the four that I think everybody who's participating in this call wants and needs to know about. Everyone needs to know about Section 107, the Doctrine of Fair Use. Librarians need to know about Section 108, the special protections and exemptions that librarians get. And educators need to know about Section 110A, the face-to-face -face classroom exemption, and Section 110B, the TEACH Act. So in a 
introductory program where I only have another half hour remaining, I want to just give you an overview of all four of these exemptions, and then we'll get to dig in to a couple of them in more detail. Okay, I think the idea of thinking about exemptions is that they're the way that copyright law achieves the balance between owners and users. Exemptions are the way that copyright law balances the rights of owners and users. Because if you think about it, if copyright law gave all kinds of protection to owners and no protection to users, then it would be almost certainly the case that the copyright law would be in violation of the First Amendment, right? The right to freedom of expression is such an important right in our culture that um, sometimes people think about the exemptions as kind of like an afterthought or an accident. They say, oh, they're so vague and they don't really, they're not really apply, but no. Peter Yazzie is really firm on this and he helps us understand that copyright laws inclusion of section 107, section 108, and section 110 are absolutely the way that owners can never be too powerful and have too much control because the legal system is built on this careful balancing of rights. So that's really interesting to think about. Now, li libraries wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the many protections that librarians get under section 108. And in this introduction, I don't have an, enough time really to focus on all of the interesting aspects of section 108. But the one that I'm paying most attention to is the ability of section 108 to allow librarians to digitize video in obsolete formats. Of course, our technologies are obsolescing faster than we know what to do with. I'm sure there are people in this room who can't recognize all four of these technologies, right? Because some of them are not as familiar as others. Um, but libraries uh, are able to um, make digital copies of obsolete content. And one group that's really helping to support that is Video Trust. I've placed a link to their great work in the website, uh, um, the homepage for this event. Um, the, uh, the work that they're doing with due diligence is enabling librarians to essentially crowdsource the process of making sure that their digital copies of obsolete videos are legal. And that's a really important work that is happening now and is continuing to develop. Um, another thing I'm pretty excited about in the Section 8 front is uh, the annual, we just passed the Public Domain Day 2020, which was January 1st. Um, so beginning uh, January 20, public domain works created in uh, 1924 are available to all. And the folks at the Duke University Law School uh, Center for the Study of Public Domain are mm, helping people understand the power of what happens when um, creative work becomes, falls into the public domain and can be freely uh, remixed and reworked by anyone. One part of the section 108 is really intriguing to me. It's Section 108H, this law, this little provision, allows libraries to scan and make available materials published between 1923 to 1941 if those materials are not actively being sold, right? The, it's the last 20 years of the copyright uh, law. And um, uh, the librarian at the Internet Archive who created this group, this collection, she decided to call it the Sonny Bono Memorial Collection because that's the law that extended copyright term limits to make them longer and stronger than ever before. She's already uploaded uh, 708 examples of material created in this time period that could be used. 
Okay, so section 108 is fascinating. You might have questions about section 108 and we'll definitely be able to talk about that in our, as we have our open Q&A in just a few more minutes. Section 110A is my favorite part of the law. It's um, sometimes known as the Face-to-Face -face Teaching Act. It basically allows you to use any lawfully acquired work during face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities. That means you can use a um, DVD that you bought at a yard sale. <laughs> Uh, that means you can use a YouTube video that you got free on the internet. Um, the performance or display of any lawfully acquired work in the course of face-to-face -face teaching and learning is also what lets you make photocopies, right? And pass a copy out to every student. Because when the copyright law was written in 1976, that was the new technology they were thinking about photocopies. Now comes section 107, my favorite part of the law, but also the one that can be most complicated and tricky for folks because, I mean, look at that language. Who can understand that? It's not, doesn't make any sense. It's full of legal language. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but what it says is that you don't need a license. You don't need to pay or ask permission to use copyrighted works when your purpose is criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. Isn't that fascinating? Um, so I am absolutely uh, thrilled to see. I'm going to just go back. I'm going to go back one slide here. I see in the. Um, I see in the. Um, in the chat room, the question about VHS, is it considered an obsolete format, right? Is LP vinyl an obsolete format? And this is a, and Paul, you're totally right on that. Um, the question of obsolete is uh, situational and contextual, right? And that means it might vary from place to place, right? In some places, VHS is obsolete because there's no VHS players. In some school districts, DVD is becoming obsolete because there's no devices that will play a DVD in some schools, right? So um, in, in some ways, the idea of um, obsolete has to be understood in its um, kind of in its full context, varying from place to place and institution to institution. But now on to fair use. We get this idea that in order for copyright to balance the rights of users and owners, that um, some purposes of, some uses of, create, of copyrighted material can happen without payment or permission. Uh, Carrie Russell said it best, I think, uh, when she explained fair use this way. She said fair use not only allows but encourages socially beneficial uses of copyrighted work such as teaching, learning, and scholarship. Without fair use, these beneficial uses, quoting from copyrighted works, providing multiple copies to students in class, creating new knowledge based on um, previously published knowledge would be infringements. Fair use is the means of assuring a robust and vigorous exchange of copyrighted information, right? So here are the four choices that are always available to us. We can always choose to use public domain, royalty-free or Creative Commons content. We can always choose to pay a permission or pay a license fee. We can claim an exemption and use copyrighted materials without payment or permission, or we can choose to not use it. Now, Reed, you ask a really interesting question here in the chat. You say, how do you perceive using electronic reserves like Canvas or Blackboard to allow the face-to-face -face use of materials scanned for scans made from either personal library or consortium book? 
thank you for asking this really great question. This question actually forces us to go back to uh, right there. So when the copyright law was amended by the TEACH Act, that was a long time ago now, maybe more than 10 years, to create Section 110B, it was kind of a well-meaning act. It said it was trying, the TEACH Act was trying to be responsive to the changes that were happening in um, what they called at that time, distance learning, right? But uh, unfortunately, the TEACH Act was written so very narrowly that it hardly applies to any contemporary cases today because the digital learning landscape has changed just so much in the last 10 or 15 years. So how do I perceive using electronic research reserves like Canvas or Blackboard to allow the face-to-face -face use of materials scanned for scans made with from personal library or consortium book? I think that falls very squarely under section 107 fair use right so in some ways the mm, important thing to realize is that there's a kind of a hierarchy of these exemptions fair use applies to everyone for a variety of different purposes for having to do with scholarship teaching learning and creative work some exemptions apply specifically to librarians, other exemptions apply specifically to educators, but everyone is entitled to fair use. So if you can use a more general exemption, um, then, then, you then you should. And so people shouldn't feel, feel boxed in by the narrowly written uh, rulings of section 110B. Now, Bobby asks a good question. If you're writing a book for educational purposes, she asks, do we need to ask or pay for permission to use a chart or a term, or can we just give credit to it? What a great question. Well, this will depend on your publisher, Bobby. Because <laughs> your publisher is the, for all intents and purposes, the copyright holder most of the time when you are uh, involved in writing a book. Um, in general, if you're using a small portion of somebody else's copyrighted work, uh, simply a an acknowledgement of the source is sufficient. If, you, if what you're um, copying is the whole thing and it represents the totality of the work, then you probably want to ask and pay for permission. I'll give you a great example of that um, I, in fact, I think to do that, I'm going to, um, I'm going to take you, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to take you to uh, the very, very famous, I'm writing a new book about, um, I'm writing a new book about, um, propaganda. And so I wanted to, um, I wanted to use uh, Vanessa uh, Otero's beautiful media bias chart, right? Maybe you have seen this chart, right? Um, so I couldn't just use a portion of it. It wouldn't make any sense to my readers. I needed to use the whole thing. In this case, I paid and asked, I asked permission and I paid for a license fee to use the work because even though my book is for educational purposes, I'm using 100% of the work. So uh, when I'm using the whole work, um, I'm really retransmitting the work. I'm not uh, adding value. I'm not repurposing. I'm not transforming it. I'm just copying it. I'm copying it because I think it's going to apply to my, my readers are going to have value in it. So uh, read that whole 10% rule comes from the educational use guidelines um, that we acknowledged was um, 
not part of copyright law, right? So um, now here's a question from Patty I'd love to answer. In a way, um, this brings us uh, to a fair use question for sure. When advertising library programs, Patty asks, can images be used without permission and be considered exempt by the fair use clause because our programs are not for profit and educational? Aha, that is actually a complicated and wonderfully interesting question. So let me go back to my slides. So we know that when we make a fair use uh, evaluation, we consider the nature of the copyrighted work, the purpose of the work and our purpose of the work, the amount of the work we're using and the effect of the work on the potential market, right? So in some ways, the best case that has ever come forward in the American legal system to explain fair use is this great case called Bill Graham Archives versus Dorling Kindersley Limited. This case helps us understand how fair use reasoning actually applies. Here's the story behind this case. Um, Bill Graham Archives was a guy who basically collected and he was a music promoter and he he's the guy who was responsible for all those really wild and crazy posters that they used to share around the hate Ashbury district in San Francisco and many other cities around the United States. Uh, he collected and um, he collected posters from this time period and he his his musical um, promotion company created some of these posters as well. Well, then there's Dorling Kindersley. They're the, um, I don't know, what would you call that? Like a coffee table book? They make these glossy, very visually graphic uh, books that are um, really about topics about fandom and topics that people like, cats, dogs, and the Grateful Dead, right? So, Dorling Kindersley wanted to use two of the posters from Bill Graham archives in the book. And they negotiated. Dorling Kindersley said, we'll give you $10. And Bill Graham said, no, we want $10,000. And Dorling Kindersley said, we'll give you $20. It's like, nope, we'll give you $9,000. $9, they could not come to a financial agreement. Bill Graham wanted too much money. Dorling Kindersley was only willing to pay a small amount because look, their book is filled filled with images. They couldn't come to terms. So the publisher did something kind of courageous. Dorling Kindersley went ahead and published the two posters without payment or permission. They just put them in the book. Well, Bill Graham Archives was furious and they sued. And the courts basically made this legal reasoning. The courts said, the original poster, the purpose of the original poster was to generate publicity for a concert. But as the poster image was used in the book, the purpose changed. The purpose was to document and illustrate the concert event in historical context, right? So courts really recognized that transformative purpose is really at the heart of creativity. Right, now, back to Patty's question, right? Back to Patty's question. Pa Patty made us wonder, um, well, if you're advertising a library program, can you use the book cover, right, Patty? Something like that, the book cover without permission? And would that be, considered exempt from the uh, fair use clause. Um, the, um, the answer to that is kind of complicated, I think, because we, we might want to think about what's the purpose of the cover, right? So the purpose of the cover is for marketing, right? A book's cover is designed to market the book. And what's your purpose for using it in your poster? Well, your purpose is exactly the same, right? 
you're, you're trying to get publicity for the event. So I'm not sure that fair use applies to your use of a book cover in library promotion because strictly speaking under uh, fair use, I'm not sure your use transforms is sufficiently transformative. And that's, I think, partly why um, librarians often use um, the images that have been cleared by vendors uh, on this on this front. Um, now, Paul asks, do, how do you feel about the fair use evaluation tools? Um, do I feel they're overly simplified or do I have a favorite? Um, right now, I, I have a kind of a new favorite because you know things are changing uh, quite a lot. And my new favorite comes here. I'm gonna see if I can, uh, I'm gonna see if I can turn my computer on to, or showcase this to you just a second here. Um, oh, I've lost, I've lost track. I really love the New York University Law School, the, the New York University um, uh, materials on fair use. Let me just share my screen with you and show those to you in a, in a, in a heartbeat here. Um, the fair use evaluation tools are pretty good scaffolds for the process, but I feel like um, it takes practice. It takes practice to make a fair use determination. And I feel like the problem with the fair use evaluation tools is they sometimes don't uh, create that dialogic context to get the context details. You know, um, um, Peter Yancey used to say something really important in explaining how context and situation situation were really invaluable. He said it was kind of sometimes uh, dangerous to oversimplify fair use with the checklist evaluation tools because of the way that context got lost in the process. I do like the copyright basics that are available at the NYU library. I think the uh, suggestions here for applying fair use are terrific. Um, and so right now, this is kind of my new favorite uh, tool. But um, in general, I think the best way to practice fair use reasoning is to ask these three simple questions. And so let me just share with you my, my, my three simple questions that I think are the most powerful way to make a fair use determination. And hold on just a second. Uh, it's 2.53, can you believe it? Oh my gosh, there's hardly any time left. So this is actually a good slide to leave, leave you with, right? I think that almost any fair use case can be determined by asking these three questions. First of all, before we do that, let's just enjoy this beautiful image for a second, right? Many of you will recognize this as itself a kind of um, appropriation of a comic artist uh, and artists, uh, 20th century artists, like um, have reused these kinds of materials. Um, but she's crying over this difficult question. Did I transform the image or just copy it? So Making that determination involves thinking carefully about the context and situation of your use. Here are three questions that make it easier to make a fair use determination. First, did your use of the work repurpose or transform the copyrighted material? Are you using it for a new purpose, right? And did your, does your use of that work add value to it? Does your use merely retransmit the original work? Could your work serve as a substitute or replacement for the original? And number three, did you use only the amount needed to accomplish your purpose? When my students ask to use copyrighted music in their YouTube videos, we have a conversation about the question number two. 
Could your work serve as a substitute or replacement for the original? Well, it's certainly the case that music's purpose is to create a mood, right? A feeling. And so when you use music in your creative work, you use copyrighted music in your creative work, you're using it for the same purpose as the original. It creates a mood or a feeling. It's possible that your use of you, that your use of that copyrighted material could be a substitute for the original. And those are factors that weigh against fair use. So these three guidelines help us understand that there are cases when we can use uh, uh, copyrighted material in fair ways, but we have to think really carefully about our purpose. We have to guard against this idea that we might retransmit, take over in a way, the author's um, um, privilege to transmit themselves and only use the content that is absolutely necessary for the job. Asking those three questions can really help make a fair use determination. And in, and in some ways, um, that's probably a great place to leave you with. Um, what I wanted to do is give you a sense of what's happening next, because we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into uh, copyright in our, um, our next program. So let me share my screen with you. Um, so next month, we'll take a little bit deeper dive. We'll look at copyright in the context of online learning, and we'll take a look at copyright in the context of student creativity. Um, and so our next program is scheduled for Tuesday, March 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern. If you want to access the slides that I shared with you, please feel free to download them, to repurpose them, to use them, to share them with your materials. And then I've put some key links to ideas that I'm really, uh, intrigued about now. The um, copyright in the public domain video that I shared with you from Wikipedia, copyright basics from New York University, the resources that we offer at the Media Education Lab. We have a three-step process for introducing copyright education to uh, educators. It includes read the book, watch the videos, use the lesson plans, and then even all the materials for um, providing a staff development program and revising your school policies so you can adopt a model school copyright policy for your school or district. Okay, so um, maybe this is kind of useful as a last parting message. If you're copying uh, to avoid making a purchase, that's probably a copyright violation. If you're copying to merely exploit the popularity of another's work, that's probably a copyright violation. And when the copyright becomes a substitute or replacement for the original, your little red warning lights should go on. But here's the thing, nobody can make a copyright determination for you. You're responsible for making that determination yourself. Congress didn't give making a fair use determination. He didn't give that power to librarians. He didn't give that power to teachers. He gave the copyright, the Congress gave that right to every citizen of the United States. You are empowered to make a uh, determination about fair use using your understanding of the law, your understanding of the context, and your understanding of the situation. Anyway, thanks very much for participating in this webinar. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for being our co-sponsor. I'm gonna let you have the last word. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for sharing the beginning basics of copyright. And as Renee mentioned, we will have those three additional webinars that will dive deeper into the digital and the images uh, 
um, and other areas of copyright that she mentioned. And those of you that asked your questions today, I hope that you receive the answers you're looking for and that the next two webinars will also cover maybe additional webinars or additional questions. And also, don't forget, if you have that burning question, that you put that in a private chat to Renee and she will get that answer to you. And those of you with the Northeast Ohio Regional Library System, we will be posting those additional webinars and you'll have access to attend those as well. So we're happy to be collaborating with the Media Education Lab and nice to see everyone this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you so much for joining. Melissa, thanks so much for being a great partner. I'll see you guys next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.